We are in uh, our series of Mark, of course. If you've missed a week, be sure to go and catch up. All the, all the sermons are in our media library on our website. You can find them there. Mobile app makes it really easy to watch and follow the sermons as well. Um, and as we're nearing the finish line of Mark's gospel, this morning it's, you, we find that the intensity of all the events kind of is beginning to escalate. There is tension. There is emotion. The stakes could not be higher. Uh, moreover, we're about to see what three years of Jesus' trouble of investing this ragtag group of disciples is going to yield for him in his time of need, right? We kind of know where the story goes. However, yeah, we're going we're gonna to see that unfold in our text today. And what we're going to find is it kind of ends at a, a very bleak place. But I want to remind us that we have the benefit of knowing the story and recalling the story beyond the story. Can I get an amen to that? Because right, we know where it all goes. And what we know is we see what happens, that there is redemption and hope even for those who fall short, who miss the mark. And just keep in mind that our story does not end with our text today. We know that Easter is coming and the church is about to be born. And that's super excited, right? Come on, church. Very exciting stuff. So we're about to see all of that. So keep that in mind. But for now, open your Bibles with me. We're going to go to Mark 14 and uh, continue there. We do have a large bit of text today. I'm going to break it up in three big chunks so that you won't completely fall asleep on me. Uh, you may need to nudge your neighbors today. Help them stay with us. Uh, take some notes if that helps. I don't have near as many fill-in-the-blanks as last week, so it should be easy work. But we're going to start with uh, Mark 14. We're going to pick up in verse, uh, verse 43. If you follow along with me in your Bibles or on the screen, it says this. And immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. Then you can take him away under guard. As soon as they arrived, Judas walked up to Jesus, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Verse 46, then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out a sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Jesus asked them, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you've come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there among you teaching every day, but these things are happening to fulfill what the scriptures say about me. Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. Uh, that doesn't mean they went and bought him a nice treat after dinner. They left him. They abandoned him. And the sheer drama of the scene is really quite unparalleled. Uh, consider for a moment just the characters in the story and the responses in the intensity of the moment. You have Judas the traitor. In fact, there's this incredible painting. It, it might be a little hard to see. Uh, it's, it, this was, this was uh, painted uh, in 1538, and it depicts the scene. It's a little hard to make out here. You should look it up. Uh, but it has all the characters I'm about to tell you about are, are, are depicted here in some way. You have Judas the tra traitor who, with a great attention to detail, plotted to give up the very one who had invited him into his inner, inner circle. And furthermore, he betrays Christ in the most cowardice and treacherous of ways, a kiss, right? a customary greeting, a friendship and respect. From it, he helps coin the expression, the kiss of death. You ever heard that? And how terrible it is to betray, be betrayed by a friend who would still pretend to wish you well, to honor you, but secretly plots your undoing. Then you have the arresting mob in the picture. They're armed with swords and clubs. They're sent by the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law, the elders of Israel. They're there to back up the action in case Jesus and his followers put up a fight. They knew that Jesus had at least a, about a 11 or 12 dedicated men wi willing to, to fight, if, and they weren't going to leave anything to chance. So they came in sheer numbers. And, and if there's anything to fear at all, it's this mob. They, they are who you should be afraid of. Because they're ready and willing to inflict harm if anyone gets in their way or tries anything. As Barclay puts it, it is they who emanate terror, not Jesus. 
And they violently grabbed Jesus with many hands to secure him. And then you have the son named sword wielding disciple. He's armed and he was clearly waiting for the moment. He was prepared to defend Christ if he needed to. Mark refers to him as one of the men, but nearly 30 or 40 years later, John would disclose in his gospel his identity as being none other than Peter, the first among equals. And it's unclear why Mark hid his identity in his gospel, although it's been suggested that proximity to these events when Mark was writing this record caused him to protect Peter's identity um, even at the time of writing. Then you have the disciples. A lot of good they were. As Barclay puts it, their nerves cracked, they could not face it. And in the heat of the moment, they quickly realized that if they stuck around, they're probably going to face the same fate that Jesus is, and they know that execution is on their agenda, and they understood it. So their response uh, it, it, we, is really easy to see, and with his response, when Mark writes it, it kind of causes all of us to put ourselves for just a moment in their shoes and consider what would we have done, but then we shy away from reflecting on that when we realize we probably would have got out of there as well. And then you have Jesus, who Barclay accurately describes as the one oasis of serenity in the chaos of everything going on. The crazy thing here is that if anyone should be distraught, if anyone should be acting up, if anyone should be throwing a fit, it should be Jesus. Consider everything that just happened to him. This, this man who he's invent, called a friend and offered the cup to, who was in his inner circle, has just betrayed him of all things with a kiss. You got Peter, who he's the leader of the gang, and what you need from him most is he, he gives the opposite of that in that moment with his leadership. And then the disciples, they quickly kind of back into the darkness of the garden, leaping over the walls to freedom. And then you got this crowd scowling at him, their muscles tense, and they're, they're, they're clutching and ganging uh, up on him. And he's, there's no chance of escape, even if that was his agenda. And yet in his text, Mark so brilliantly, I, of course, remember that his text is inspired by who? The Holy Spirit. Somehow conveys that it's not the Sanhedrin authority that's directing these events. It's Jesus, once again, who is somehow, in all of this, in control of it all. That's really something to see. Now, there's one more character in the scene. In fact, if we were to go back to that picture uh, for just a, a moment here, uh, Jeremy, if you can go back. It's really hard to, it's hard, hard to make out that painting. Uh, in the, it's really hard, but in the upper left-hand corner, there's a figure up in blue and someone grabbing them. It depicts this next character. It's really hard to see. In there, but it's really kind of interesting. I'm glad they've depicted it before and not after what we're about to read. Because here's what verse 51 52 says One young man following behind was clothed only in a long linen shirt. And when the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and ran away. Say it with me naked. Some of you are like, Well, there's my new, that's a, that's a memory verse you don't hear about very often. How many worship songs have been written about this? Zero. In fact, uh, kind of a, a little funny thing is when I was a youth pastor many, 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 many moons ago, uh, I, I remember I read this passage and I was so struck and inspired, I decided that a sermon must be written for my students. And the title of my message was, Would You Run Naked for Jesus? Right? That was it. I couldn't keep anyone's attention that entire, you know, message. I don't, it probably made no sense at all. But anyway, I had a thought in there somewhere. But... Um, this is definitely one of the strangest incidents recorded in all the old, in the New Testament, by the way. You kind of read that and you're like, what? What, what, what happened there? What's that about? And uh, how have I missed this detail before? And more importantly, why does Mark seem interested in capturing this odd little detail after going through the whole scene and explaining everything? He calls out this one thing here. Well, most scholars tend to agree that the most, that the, the most probable cause for its placement in Mark's account is that this young man was John Mark himself. And that it was his way of telling us, I was there without telling his name at the time of writing. Tradition suggests that, uh, by the way, that the home that they were sharing the Passover meal in, they just come from, was likely John Mark's mother Mary's home, which we can learn about in Acts 4 and Acts 12. We kind of learn that her home becomes... She kind of gives it up as a gathering place, a chief meeting place for the disciples. 
uh, in, the, in the early church, we see that in use. Her home was in Jerusalem, and, and, and it seems by the, the fact that she could have room for everybody, it must have been a larger home. She may have been uh, well off in some way. And it's kind of posited that, you know, at the time that Judas left the dinner to go fetch the arresting party, and, you know, they're trying to get back and get Jesus, that while he's gone, Jesus and the disciples go out to uh, Gethsemane, but then Judas probably shows up with the rabble to arrest him, and Jesus isn't there. And in the, in the moment, it was likely John Mark, who is present there as a young man, likely probably tries, tries to get ahead of them to go warn the apostles, and he probably just ran out with his nightshirt on. And it's, that's a probable explanation of how the scene came to be. Alternatively, maybe just because they were in his house, he was hanging out with them anyway and spent some time with them. We can't really know. Those things are just all speculation, but it's kind of interesting to think about. Either way, this little hint perhaps tells us something more about Mark's life and experience of Jesus, even though as Mark would tell us, he was not, or we would be told later, he's not one of the twelve. So he's not one of the disciples, but I think it's interesting. Let's jump ahead to the next portion of Scripture. We're going to go to pick up in verse 53. It says this, They took Jesus to the high priest's home, where the leading priests and elders and the teachers of the religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard, and there he sat with the guards warming himself by the fire. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. Notice that they're not trying to find out what's going on or what's wrong. They're just trying to figure out how to pin, you know, frame it in such a way as to kill him. They couldn't find any evidence, though. So, verse 56, many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they didn't get their story straight. Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. And by the way, that is a fulfillment of Scripture. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Finally, throughout all of Mark's gospel, we've been hearing this messianic secret of who he really was, and it's been suppressed in order to maintain the careful sequence and unfolding of everything that God has got planned. However, what we've really longed for is all along the way, we're just, we want everyone to shout from the rooftops, this is Jesus, the Messiah. This is your King. We just kind of want everyone, we want Jesus to stand up and take on that, that title and to step into that. We want it all along the way, but it is now when he finally answers. And he's before the high priest and everyone present, he answers clearly and unmistakably, I am. And when he said, I am, by the way, he answers in the way that God answers when revealing his identity. I am goes all the way back to the burning bush of, of Exodus 3 when God said, I am who I am. And as those listening mouths fell agape, and when he said, I am, oh, their jaws hit the floor, and they were rattled, and they were immediately incensed. But he would go on to say, he would say, I am, and then he says, and you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. So not only is he confessing his identity, But he's warning them at the same time, alluding to several Old Testament passages such as, if you want to write them down, you can, Isaiah 52.8, Psalm 110.1, and Daniel 7.13. He effectively tells them, I am, and you are judging me, but it is I who will judge you. (laughs) It wasn't lost on them. We don't pick that up so easily. They knew what he was saying. And And when he says this, when he says this, The high priest loses his mind. He goes out of control. He says this, you know, I mean, well, I'll come to that in a second, but you can't find anything but courage and confidence in his response. 
Jesus was many things in that moment, but afraid of, their, of these men, afraid of their authority, not, not something he was in that moment. But again, here's the high priest, verse 63. We'll go through our last passage here, part of the, the Scripture. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, Why do we need another, other witnesses? You've all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. And then some of them began to spit on him. They blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. Maybe we'd be good to remember that when we're wondering what Jesus has done for us lately. And they say here in verse 65, prophesy to us, they jeered, and the guards slapped him as they took him away. Verse 66, meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, you were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. Just then, a rooster crowed. And when the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, you must be one of them because you are a Galilean. And Peter swore, A curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. And suddenly Peter's words flashed through Peter's mind, or Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he broke down and wept. Strauss remarks, Peter the rock here reaches rock bottom. Wright also sees something interesting here. N.T. Wright, he says, he, he kind of points out that while in verse 65, Jesus is being accused of being a helpless prophet as the people spit on him and blindfold him and beat him with their fat fists, and they're like, prophesy, tell us who hit us, who hit you, right? In verse 71, Jesus is vindicated as a true prophet because the very thing he said that Peter would do unfolds exactly the way that he said it would unfold. That's an interesting contrast. Now, as I think about Peter in this moment and, and, and given the events of the evening, you would think that, that some caution should be given. You, you would think Peter would be more careful than he's even being. Notice that Peter wants to follow Jesus. He wants to stay close, but he also wants to stay comfortable. He's by the fire. You know, and uh, that, a lot of Christians kind of like to do that as well. But I want you to kind of notice here that, you know, he, he doesn't necessarily just stay out of sight completely. I mean, I think all the other disciples thought that that would be prudent, and they did that. But when he gets called out the first time by the servant girl, you know, now you're thinking, get out of there, dude. You got to get it. You know, it's, now it's really dangerous because now you're not only here, but they've identified you as one of his followers, and you're still hanging out there, but, but he still stays. And my point in calling that out is that Despite Peter's infamous denial of Christ, what we fail to recognize in Peter is that actually he was really quite courageous in many ways. Because the others took off and they're nowhere in sight. But Peter's trying to stay as close as he felt he could safely could. And, and the truth of it is, he probably stayed a lot longer than any of us would have. But it seems even the most divided, uh, or, uh, devoted have a breaking point and we all can understand why a premature death was not on Peter's list of things to do that weekend. Now when it comes to covering up his identity, when it counted most, what did Peter do? He denies everything. However, if you recall that when Jesus was pressed for his identity, he could only speak the truth. N.T. Wright on this would say, Jesus retains his integrity at the cost of his life. Peter loses his integrity to save his skin. And I, 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 I think how often we are tempted to do the same thing at times in our life. You know, what is more remarkable still as I contemplate all of this is that is, is just how reliable the Gospels are historically and factually and, and everything else. They're not just made-up stories. You know, one of the ways that you know these are not made-up stories is because people don't write themselves out to be the villain and failures in their own stories. You have to think of this. 
Mark is writing is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but who is his source? Anyone? It's Peter. Think about that. How would Mark even know this except that Peter told exactly what happened that night where he felled so miserably? And that's what makes the gospel so reliable is because people who write stories and make up stories don't paint themselves to be anything other than heroes in the story. But Peter isn't interested in telling a story where he's repainted as a hero. He's telling the story of Jesus and he's willing to include his own sin and failure to help the message be received. Here's what William Barclay comments on this and it's really beautiful. He says, he used his own shame as a magnet to draw others to Christ. That is what Peter did. He told people, I heard him and let him down like that. And still he loved and forgave me, and he can do the same for you. And when we read this passage with understanding the story of Peter's cowardice, it becomes an epic of courage, and the story of his shame becomes the tale of glory. I can't help but to think about these men, these disciples, and their their early development. They're three years into their discipleship, and yet when it comes down to the wire they're unwilling to give everything they're unwilling to surrender all what did they do they ran terrified for their lives but here's what i want to remind you of because again we know the story beyond the story what we know is that these men would go on and more than compensate and redeem themselves because we know that all but one would suffer martyrdom for the sake, the name, and the message of Jesus Christ. Now the traditions vary in cases and, and, um, and, and the details on some of these events are, are not as clear as others. But let me just remind you of what all these men who ran that night, just exactly what they then learned from that and what they in turn would do later at the end of their life. Let's begin with Peter. He'd be crucified upside down on a cross. And, he, and that was at his request because he didn't consider himself to be worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord Jesus Christ. You had Andrew, who according to early Christian writings, Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. We now refer to it as St. Andrew's cross. Bartholomew or Nathaniel was said to have either been beheaded or flayed alive and then beheaded. Uh, usually when you look at the crest of, of him, it involves three blades. Th- Thomas or Didymus, he is said to have traveled to the far coast of India, founding communities of faith and performing miracles in the name of Jesus. He was martyred in Mylapore, India, where he was stabbed with spears on July 3rd, 72 AD. They at least had the courtesy to write the date down. Philip, it's said that during his powerful ministry, he converted the wife of a Roman proconsul, and in retaliation, he had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. Matthew was said to have been stabbed to death in Ethiopia with a halberd. James, son of Alphaeus, was said to have been crucified in Egypt. James, the son of Zebedee, brother of John, was executed by the sword under the orders of King Herod Agrippa. He was the first of the apostles to die. You can go to Acts chapter 12 and read about his death. Simon the Zealot and Thaddeus or Jude were were said to have been martyred for their faith in Persia after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. Matthias, who was the apostle who replaced Judas, was sent to his death by being burned alive. Then we come to the one who remained, and that is John the Beloved. Only John is said to have died an old death for natural reasons. But yet, it wasn't for the sake of someone trying to kill him more than once. Roman Emperor Domitian commanded the apostle be boiled to death in oil, but John continued to preach from within the pot. Another time, he was forced to drink poison, but as promised in Mark 16, 18, it didn't hurt him. Finally, he was banished to the island of Patmos as a prisoner in uh, in 97 AD, but after hearing of Domitian's death, he returned to Ephesus where he died peacefully at the age of 80. And perhaps, and I wonder if it was that early test that they had of their perseverance and commitment to Jesus in the garden that ultimately would steal their resolve when faced with their own garden moments. And they passed the test. May it be so with us. 
So we wonder, you know, why is it the people abandon Jesus? And, and it's throughout our text today we see there are r- several wrong ways in which we can respond to Jesus. Some outright reject Him. Some outright, they just outright, that is the crowd. That are, those are the religious leaders. They represent the complete rejection of Jesus and His message. John, in John 7.7, 7, Jesus said, The world hates Him because, it says, Jesus, Jesus said, because I accuse the world of doing evil. So the world hates him. You can't say that about us. We don't like that. We don't like that, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells us that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. So there are many who just outright reject Jesus. Some take inappropriate action in His name and therefore abandon Him. It's like the disciple who draws the sword Peter, there's good intentions. He had every hope of uh, defending Christ and advancing His purposes and, and stand up for Jesus as if Jesus needs us to stand up for Him. Yet they're out of step with His nature. They're out of step with His character. They're out of step with the person of Christ. I wonder how many Christians today effectively abandon Jesus by behaving in ways that Jesus does not authorize, does not condone, does not desire, doesn't ask for. In fact, one day, those Christians will have to give an account for the way they've responded as being out of step with his character. And so we can respond inappropriately. And I, I really want to challenge this. I don't want to get too far off track here. But I really feel in my heart this is something that our, the church today, the church, the American church needs to hear today. We need to remember Peter was a good godly man and was the rock of the church. He didn't lose his place. But how did Peter respond in the moment when he thought it was all on the line to stand up for Jesus? He pulled out a sword and started lopping ears off. What did Jesus say to him? Put away your sword. You can live by the sword to die by the sword. This is not how the kingdom of God works. And before we feel like that violence and we feel like that you know action is the thing that we must do to stand up for Jesus we need to be remembered what he said to Peter and know that there are times when we take actions that are actually inappropriate for his disciples and we need to reconsider what he wants what his nature is how he would respond to those who curse him abuse him and would strip him away Finally, there are just some who just straight up abandon Jesus. Actually, many do. Jesus said, many will turn away from me and will betray and hate each other. That's in Matthew 24. The disciples, what did they do? They fled the scene at the first sight of trouble. They were out of there. Mark Strauss writes this. And boy, I read it and I thought, oh, Mark, that is so true. I'm going to read this slowly because I wanted it to soak in as, as I do. It says, Many people are attracted to Christianity or come to church for social reasons or business opportunities. Others hope that Christianity will meet their emotional needs or make their problems go away. Yet, when temptations, difficulties, or hardships come, they decide it's not worth it and they move on to other self, self-help fads. They are like the seed that fails, falls on rocky ground in Jesus' parable, who receive the word with joy, but then fall away when trouble or persecution comes. And he is exactly right. And that's the reason that many will abandon him. But for the heart that's warm towards Jesus yet sometimes timid and sometimes failing, there's something we can keep in mind. It's because while this passage we just read doesn't tell us of the restoration of Peter, we know it happens. Can I get an amen? And we know it doesn't tell the story of the restoration of the disciples, but we know that it happens. We know that even in the midst of these failures, God is the God of second chances. And I, for one, am so grateful for that. And let's be honest, it's not just second chances. It's a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and on and on it goes. P- 
Peter's story reminds us that God loves us despite our failings. And like the loving father in the parable of the prodigal son, he's always waiting with open arms to welcome us back into his full fellowship with him. That's also Strauss. So despite the failures of these men at this late hour of the night, we should remember the story beyond the story. There's redemption and hope even for those of us who fall short and miss the mark. My story would be just like Peter's in that I heard him and I let him down. I let him down in a really bad way, but still he loved me and forgave me. And he can do the same for you. He can do the same for you, church. I'm going to invite you just to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And I just, first of all, just want to make a plea to those of you in the room, those of you watching online, do you need to run to him for forgiveness? It's time to stop hiding in the shadows. It's time to cease the running away when things are difficult. It's time to turn to Jesus and seek the forgiveness, his forgiveness for your sins. Is that you today? Do you need to do that? I would just say, if that's you today, right where you're sitting, every head bowed, every eyes closed, would you raise your hand and say, that is me. That is me. I, I need that. Thank you. Anyone else? I, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else online, if that's you, and let us know in chat. We only ask because we want to pray for you or send me a message. I want, I want to be able to pray for you. But today's the day where you can, you can receive that forgiveness, receive that grace, Stop the running, stop the hiding, and be made whole. Have you failed him in some way? Do you need restoration? Then my plea to you today is to come and be restored. Be restored. Be restored. And for all of us as disciples today, we're challenged to ask the questions like, are we following Jesus from a distance in safety and comfort? Do the people we interact with on a daily basis even have an idea that we are Christians? Do we deny it? Do we run from it? And these things remind us of the demands of discipleship where in Mark 8, 38, Jesus said, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And therefore we say, Lord, we repent we ask for forgiveness. We pray you would make us bold. We pray you would make us strong. We pray we would no longer be wishy-washy. We wouldn't be straddling the fence. We would be not on the edge of the kingdom, but in the kingdom. And right now, I want to pray for those who raise their hand for forgiveness and restoration. Lord, right now, as they raise their hand, it is their testimony. They need your grace and forgiveness and healing. And I pray, Lord, as they ask it by their faith, would you dispense that and would you, would you just love on them and, and heal them, forgive them and make them new today. Thank you that your blood was shed once and for all time for the remission of sins. And we just ask you to bring them in today. May they feel the warmth of your love, the grace of a second chance, the fresh slate you put before them. And Holy Spirit, give them the strength to go forward uh, away from their sin and to not return. And we are so grateful for this. Make your people a courageous people. When we each face our own test, may we not fail, may we not falter, but may we be willing to lay it all on the line as these disciples did. We thank you for your grace and all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Come on, church.